I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome you again to our college tonight. There are two rules for the College of Complexes. One is one fool at a time. The second is no personal attacks. All right. The college consists of the following format. First, we'll have an announcement period. Then we'll have our speaker who can speak up to an hour or so thereabouts. Then we'll have a question and answer period where we ask that you have questions and not just a statement because after the question and answer period, you'll have a chance to spout off your viewpoints in our infamous rebuttal period. And after a rebuttal period, we will um, have our speaker will have the last word. We need to be out by 845. It is reminded as a courtesy to the restaurant, they do want a $3 minimum charge on food. And we also have our tuition, so just get something like a cup of coffee if you're coming in. And uh, as we said, don't be a cheapskate. We are, we are here at the restaurant's discretion and they would like the service. So let's get started with you. Let's do this again. Tonight's speaker will be Roberto Jesus Clark, Associate Director for the Warehouse Workers for Justice. The Warehouse Workers for Justice fights for good, stable living wage jobs in Chicago's massive logistics and transportation industry. The association educates their workers on their rights, helps workers enforce their rights, and fights for public and private partnerships that promote full-time work with respect and fair wages in our region's warehouses and distribution centers. Let's give a rousing round of applause rousing. to Roberto Jesus Clark. Yeah. Well, 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 well. Uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, it's great to be here. My name is Roberto Clack. I'm the Associate Director of the Warehouse Workers for Justice. Um, we, uh, we were just introduced, but we're, our organization has been in existence since 2009. Uh, some people might have heard of the Republic Windows and Doors Occupation and Strike. Uh, conducted by the organization, the UE. We're a project that came out of uh, that fight. Uh, and the history of that is that that particular windows and doors factory uh, was the last of a series of manufacturers to close uh, in Chicagoland. And people were really confronted with the idea of, you know, where can we build a labor movement where manufacturing or when we get things organized, uh, just won't, you know, pack up and move and go down south or go to Mexico or go to Asia. And that's really the genesis of this idea uh, was for the Warehouse Workers for Justice was to start a uh, worker center, a nonprofit that would organize um, this massive growing warehouse industry, uh, mostly based in Will County, uh, which we'll go, in, go into. Uh, but, <coughs> excuse me. This is an industry that has to be in this particular location, um, which we'll, we'll go more into. So this is, this is a traditional warehouse as, you know, back in the olden days. Uh, you know, we still see remnants of uh, the warehousing. Um, you know, a lot of warehousing originally was, um, it was mostly unionized, uh, decent wages and benefits. Uh, predictable schedules, uh, direct hire employees, uh, and located in cities or near suburbs. And a lot of warehousing uh, was located uh, near manufacturing that, you know, was once, uh, you know, uh, a much greater prevalence in Chicago itself. Uh, so this is, this is the tendency. A lot of the warehousing was in the city core of, uh, from 1872 to the 1960s. In the 1960s to 1995, we saw warehousing uh, migrate uh, to the suburbs as uh, exurbs uh, uh, grew. We, we also saw warehousing move out there. And this, this trend can, continued for, for decades. Uh, and then something, you know, the really with the ascendance of Walmart, uh, we saw a different uh, trend. Uh, so 2005 to present, Asian imports, uh, as manufacturing has moved away, uh, Asian imports have increased and uh, there's been 
there's been much warehousing that's moved out to the the suburbs at this point, uh, especially Will, Will <coughs> County, where the largest inland port in the country is at. Um, and so, you know, basically, um, it, manufacturing goods in a we we well first of all we um, we take resources from all over the world, send them to Asia. It's manufactured there, put on a boat to train. Um, to uh, to Chicagoland, and the reason Chicagoland is such a critical uh, part of this is six out of the seven um, Class One railroads can converge here. This is the only place in the United States where that many railroads uh, converge, um, and this is this is really the the uh, latest adaptation of uh, this trend is that we're actually seeing. Uh, warehousing moving back into the city at this point and that's really happening with the ascendance of e-commerce and Amazon um, for years uh, all of the suburb uh, all the warehousing was moving uh, to the suburbs and now we're seeing as you know especially as we have last mile uh, delivery uh, by Amazon we're seeing more warehousing move uh, on 28th and Western there's a delivery station uh, there's a delivery station up in uh, Skokie right now. Uh, there's plans for warehousing in Little Village and the east side of Chicago, major developments. And really that's because they need, they need to be able to deliver products to people as quickly as possible. Uh, so we're really seeing the return of warehousing into the city proper. Um, and push, push uh, versus pull. Um, it, warehousing has really changed where, you know, you manufacture things locally, you, you send things to a warehouse and then eventually to a retail store. But there's been, there's more precision uh, and really through a, an international network of delivering our goods uh, where, where uh, people like Walmart and Amazon have really gotten it down to be able to deliver uh, products to their warehouses and then, you know, either to stores or now to uh, houses as quickly as possible uh, you know and that's that's how they make their money uh, so you know this is a if you drive down 55 corridor uh, you'll this is what you're gonna see down down 80 near Joliet uh, concrete boxes no, no longer the uh, brick uh, buildings you know that are now converted into our high-end uh, condo units the ones that are knocked down or house Google um, you know, this is this is the, the modern warehouse with the racks and, um, and all that. So these are these are some of the uh, major developers who uh, create a lot of the properties that these uh, warehouses go on. Uh, Center Point, which we'll get into, is the they own the largest inland port in the country in Will County, uh, and you can see that major union pension funds. Uh, have gone into the game. CalPERS, that's the California uh, Pension Employees Retirement System. Uh, they they uh, have a direct ownership in center point properties. Uh, so there, you can see that major uh, pension funds are part of uh, this entire logistics business and warehousing. So they they buy the properties and develop and build the warehouses, then lease the warehouses to. Uh, retailers, our third-party logistics companies, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then this is this is more of the you know where uh, in modern you know before warehousing was very good job union jobs. This is the structure that we now see, uh, and this is Walmart. Uh, so you'll see that Walmart owns the warehouse, but then there's these third-party logistics companies. Uh, that they contract out. So Schneider Logistics uh, traditionally ran the warehouse for uh, over 10 years. But you see this underneath this is staffing firms. So and they, they have these lofty aspirational kind of uh, names to them. Uh, reliable staffing, our uh, integrity staffing, our paramount staffing. I mean, and it, this is you know they it's this is uh, how they brand themselves. But you'll see that. Um, and this, this is not unusual. This is just one example of uh, a modern-day warehouse. Is uh, you know you have you have four staffing agencies that work for the third-party logistics company, 
but underneath those staffing agencies, you have multiple sub-staffing agencies that um, send workers to these staffing agencies. Um, and this is, you know, this is what makes organizing unions and modern day warehousing uh, so difficult under the National Labor Relations Act um, with the Trump interpretation is that these, there, Walmart wouldn't be a joint employer that employs all these. These would all be separate legal entities that you'd have to organize separately. So you, if you wanted to organize the workers, these would be considered, what do I have on the board? Uh, seven, nine, you know, nine different companies that you'd have to organize all at the same time with different elections. So this is this is really put a chill on being able to uh, organize more unions. It does happen and it is a slow process. Uh, there are a handful of uh, warehouses that have been organized out in Royal County, um, but this this is really makes things difficult. Um, and you can kind of see here, uh, this is the flow of uh, um, imports into the United States uh, all around the world. And you can see the majority goes through uh, the, the West Coast ports. So uh, Long, Long Beach, uh, the Port of o Oakland, Seattle gets a fair amount. Uh, but they do ship things all the way to the, the East Coast or, or down south as well through the boats. Um, you know, and then that that uh, boat traffic, that cargo traffic, will eventually make it out uh, to the rail line. So this is this is the BNSF, uh, which is uh, the largest um, rail line, and the, they have the, the largest intermodal in the entire Midwest. So and you can see how much traffic goes through Chicago. We don't, you know, a lot of people don't think of Chicago or Chicago land as a major port port area, but uh, three trillion dollars worth of goods uh, flow through this particular uh, rail system into our intermodals. Um, you know, this this is a, a photo of, of what a yard looks like. So things will, in the uh, at the busiest yard, there will be hundreds of trains, thousands of feet long a day uh, coming in. They, they unload it, put it on trucks, and that goes to a warehouse. Uh, a lot of the, you know, there's these uh, redistribution centers, which we'll get more into, but that, that's a, a central warehouse that then will feed uh, a whole region of warehouses, and those warehouses will then feed all the retail stores where we buy all our goods from. Uh, and you can see here, this is, you know, the, the massive uh, a network of intermodal yards in Chicago. So there's 25 uh, intermodals in, in Chicago. Uh, the, the busiest one is the BNSF Chicago Logistics Park in Elwood, Illinois. So they do a, a, a close to a million uh, containers uh, a year. Uh, just in Will County, 3.5% of the national GDP uh, moves out of uh, that, that area. But you can see that, um, you know, if you've been to Bedford Park, uh, our Willow Brook. There's all. There's other major um, rail yards that also do a considerable amount of freight. Uh, so this is, you know, this is trillions of trillions of dollars. Uh, so and Walmart. So logistics is truly the heart of the Walmart operation. And when we when we started as an organization, our, our focus was on Walmart because we saw them as both an innovator. Uh, and a trendsetter in what warehouse work look like in the country. Um, you know, they, they, uh, you know, a lot of their, you know, if you ever notice, most Walmarts are, are near a highway. Uh, a lot of their original distribution was done through trucking. Um, but being able to save on the fuel costs, um, you know, really incentivized them getting into this intermodal model uh, and to really embrace that. Um, so the largest global shipper, the largest private trucking fleet in the U.S., the biggest customer for the three largest uh, U.S. truck load carriers, the biggest customer for the two largest railroads in the U.S., which is the Union Pacific and the BNSF, uh, the largest warehouse operator in the U.S. That's changing now. Uh, Amazon's over, definitely in the process of overtaking Walmart, but when we started, this was all true of Walmart, and we, we focused our efforts on 
uh, them. So we can see they, these are the and um, these are the redistribution centers I talked about. The the red dots. Um, you know, so in in Elwood, Illinois, uh, the BNSF yards. Um, you know, probably about a mile away from the largest Walmart warehouse in the country. It's three point. There's two buildings. It's three point four million square feet, which is it's just enormous. Um, but so that that warehouse, uh, you can, and you can see it would distribute to the green dots all the other warehouses in the country. So this is a you know Elwood was and still is a, a critical um, point in how Walmart ships to all of its stores across the Midwest. Um, and so these um, I don't know if you can. These, those two over there are the big Walmart uh, warehouses, uh, and this is the, the BNSF yard. So this is about 700 acres um, built on the old Joliet Arsenal, which we'll talk about more. Um, and a lot of our efforts were, you know, we saw Walmart as setting, setting the standards in the industry, so we, we really focus on organizing uh, Walmart. So this is a march down in Elwood, Illinois. Over 500 people um, marched down to Walmart, and 30, 30 workers were striking uh, that day, and uh, activists from different organizations uh, actually blocked the entrance into the warehouse and uh, got arrested in civil disobedience. Um, the Dalwood Police, and there's a special Will County Task Force. Uh, there's 150 uh, police officers all in riot gear with M16 machine guns, uh, sound cannons, Hummer, the whole deal. When uh, people uh, did this protest, and you know, people say, "Well, why, why such a response?" And you know, the the, the potential is is that if people did get organized in these warehouses and, and, and organize these communities, and you could literally shut down, uh, uh, you know, a company like Walmart in this specific area where there's a choke, choke point in their distribution network, which is Elwood, Illinois. Um, so warehouse workers for justice. We have a Elwood and Joliet. We're on a mission from God. Huh. Um, so, uh, and so the, the history of the BNSF and Centerpoint is that, um, so the, the Joliet Arsenal is 24,000 square, or 24,000 acres of land south of Joliet. It's where much of our munitions was made uh, for World War II and the Vietnam War. Uh, but was decommissioned after the end of those conflicts. There was always a debate about what to do with all of this land. Uh, people talked about the largest landfill in the country. Um, people weren't really into that idea in the local area. Uh, people talked about an asphalt plant. Um, and they, people just didn't know what to do with this land. Um, so what was eventually decided is 19,000 acres of that would go into creating the Medellin uh, tall grass prairie. Uh, part of it will go into the uh, Abraham Lincoln Veterans Cemetery, the largest one in the country. Uh, and then the other part of the land was uh, to create uh, Center Point, the largest inland port uh, in the country. So the beginning of this, um, and this took years, uh, this was years in the making, uh, but the beginning of uh, the operation was in 2002 when they finally opened up the port. Uh, and you can see here a protest of the Joliet Arsenal during the Vietnam War. We had some peaceniks who said, hey, if we go to Elwood and uh, sit in front of trains, we can stop the war machine. Yeah. You know, so, but if you go to Elwood and organize workers and do civil disobedience, you could also stop global commerce. So this is, this is um, the, you know, what, what it looked like back in the day. If you, if you go, I don't know if anyone's been to Medeo and Prairie or anything like that, but you still see the army bunkers and remnants of, uh, of the site. So, um, yeah, so Center Point, the, the intermodal um, has turned Chicago into the largest container port in the Western Hemisphere. If you combine uh, these Will County intermodals with the greater Chicago network, it's, it's a, a vast amount of wealth. Uh, there's over 300, uh, since 
since Center Point was uh, built in 2002, there's over 300 warehouses that have been created in Will County, and it's the who's who of the Fortune 500. We've we've talked about Walmart, but it's Walmart, it's it's Home Depot, it's Target, it's Best Buy, uh, it's the Mars Corporation, it's Goya Food, uh, it's 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 it's. Um, you know, every major player that you can really think of uh, has a major warehouse operating in, in Will County. Uh, so this is the picture of Centerpoint, uh, and you can see here, this is uh, the original um, BNSF Logistics Park built in 2002. Up further north, you see Union Pacific, um, which is, that was built in 2010. They do about a half million uh, containers a year, but they just closed, and that's uh, Union Pacific Global 4. Uh, Union Pacific Global 3, which was created in 2003 in Rochelle, Illinois, uh, was recently closed, and they're going to send all that traffic to Joliet now. Um, but this gives you an idea, of, and it, it, this is just an enormous uh, area. This is three times the size of the loop uh, we're looking at, but this doesn't really capture the whole uh, footprint that warehousing has in Will County. This is just one part of it. You know, if you go down 55 and 80, you'll see warehousing all over the place and as you go into any of the communities in that area. Um, so, as, as I discussed, our region's a major, uh, major global transit hub, uh, over a, 8 billion square feet of warehouse space, uh, ninth largest container port in the world, uh, as I said, six of the seven major uh, railroads intersect, uh, seven major highways intersect, and we're a days haul from 60% of the continent. So Chicago is just a very strategic place for these businesses to do. Uh, and um, you can see some of the, I mentioned them already, but uh, there's Bissell, Home Depot, Step and Chemicals, uh, and the, the, the list really goes on, but this is this is the immediate uh, center point in the inland core. And there's there's been more warehouses built since this slide. They're building a harbor freight warehouse that's going to be two million square feet, and the largest um, it's going to be the largest building in all of Will County, and that's that's happening right now. If you go back two slides, it says it's a half a billion square feet, and you said a billion. I, it, I just oh. <coughs> Yeah, I might have, I might have read it wrong. I mean, it's, it's and this is this, some of this info's old, so it's actually if I said half a billion, it's it's more than that. Cause this yeah. this slide's probably two years old. So they they built a lot since then. Just okay. it gives you some sense yeah. uh, of what's going on. Um, you know, so we you know a lot of the the working conditions um, are you know there's 99 staffing agencies in Will County. Um, you know, people don't have access to benefits. Uh, sick days, vacation days. Uh, there's things like wage theft that go on. Uh, we've, we've helped workers sue some of the staffing agencies for millions of dollars in um, back wages. Uh, and, you know, so it's very hard to unionize. Uh, there's discrimination cases. We we're part of a case at a warehouse in Bolingbrook, Illinois, where women were steered away from being forklift drivers. They told women you couldn't be a forklift driver, that's only for men. But the, the problem with that is forklift driving pays more. Uh, so that was a discrimination case. So that was one example uh, of some of the things that go on. So th th definitely uh, workers have been aggrieved in organizing. But now the communities also started to rise up because they have their own set of grievances. So this picture is. Um, and this is in reference to a group called Just Say No to North Point, which is based in uh, Elwood, Illinois. Um, and over 800 residents came out for a hearing on a proposal for 2,200 acres, more of warehousing that the North Point developers were proposing. That's, that's more of than a third of the town. Uh, there's 15 hours of testimony. Uh, they had to move the, the meeting outside of the the town hall and go to the local gym because there are so many people who want to testify against it. Uh, a lot, a hundred people spoke out against uh, North Point and only three people spoke for it, uh, which was uh, people who built it. Um, so there's this um, 
this is a great picture. This is um, it's it's a little it's a little hard for me to see, but Aoi Aonoi population twenty two hundred has become a I'm sorry. A vinyl hub of Americans' consumer economy, and it's hell. So this is a this is a picture uh, in the. This is a great article. I highly recommend reading it. Uh, but this is a picture in the New Republic, um, and they they came out to do a story about what was going on in Elwood and Joliet, and uh, we were having a community meeting, and as we were having this meeting, there's a I, there's a boom. Uh, and I, I heard it, and this, this was, there was an accident that had happened uh, outside of uh, our meeting space. And this is a picture of a woman. Uh, every, everyone was okay in this accident, um, but you know she was crying and very upset and had kids in the car and things like that. They called the main route into uh, Center Point Die 53 instead of I-53 because there have been so many fatalities. Outside of the uh, the largest uh, Amazon warehouse, uh, two workers left work one day and got hit by a semi truck and killed. No, um, and now, now uh, Amazon helps pay for a police force to to guide traffic during shift changes. So the the amount of fatalities uh, from the trucking that's come into this area over 10,000 trucks a day uh, has also gone up. So that's one of the costs that people in the local communities have paid, and that's why people are so vehemently opposed to even more warehousing in the area. Um, and uh, this is a quote from the article. But this corporate Valhalla turned out to be a hell for the community, which suffered a concentrated dose of the indignities and disappointment of late capitalism in the 21st century. Instead of abundant full-time work, a regime of partial, precarious employment set in. Temp agencies flourish, but no restaurants, hotels, or grocery stores ever came, save for the recent addition of a dollar store. Tens of thousands of semis rumbled through Will County every day, wreaking havoc on the infrastructure. And as the town of Elwood scrambled to pave its potholes, its inability to collect taxes from the facilities plunged it into more than $30 million in debt. Um, so one of the promises that was made to Elwood is that if you bring this industry in, you'll have plenty of money for, for your schools and for, to, to um, and there will be all this development and you'll get these hotels and we'll get these nice restaurants and people are excited. They believed it. Uh, part of what sweetened the deal to make uh, Center Point possible was a 20 year total tax abatement to the developer. Um, and Elwood's not unique in its financial problems. Romeoville up the road also made the warehouse community $89 million in debt. Uh, Bolingbrook next door to Romeoville, $300 million in debt. Uh, people have really paid a price. We saw the Chicago Teachers Union go on strike. You know, one of the issues that they brought up was the massive uh, tax breaks for, for developers. Mm -hmm. Sterling Bay, one, one point, you know, what is it, $1.7 billion. The same exact thing's happening for corporate America. Uh, the first Amazon warehouse that was built got a $70 million tax break from the state of Illinois. Um, but the, the local communities haven't benefited in the way that they were told they would. What's that a picture of? The one what was that a picture of? It was a, thank you. Um, so that's a that's the cold waters. That's a farm in Elwood. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a farm in Elwood. Uh, the cold waters have been farming since the 1880s. They described the the, the the area in Will County as some of the best land in the country, a fertile crescent, and they want to stay. Uh, North Point is trying to push them out and buy their land and force warehousing, but they want to remain farmers. Uh, you know, and that's also part of the conflict is some people want to retain their rural and agrarian life, uh, but corporate America wants to force warehousing upon them. So that's that's also one of the fights um, that's happening. So this is a this is a picture of the I-80 bridge. This is one of the main uh, entrances into Center Point, and so uh, it recently came out that the 
safety rating for uh, these two bridges, east and westbound, uh, was a 9 out of 100 safety rating and 11 out of 100 safety rating. Uh, to give you some context, the, the bridge that fell in Minneapolis, uh, that tragedy, uh, that bridge was rated at 50 out of 100 safety. These are worse. Uh, safety ratings and they've, they've been beat to hell by all the trucks going in and out of the port and the proper resources haven't been uh, put into maintaining this bridge. Uh, this is another price the local community has to pay. Um, this is, you know, thankfully uh, as part of the last budget they're going to replace this bridge. It, it actually can't be fixed, it has to be torn down. But as, and this is going to be one of the more expensive state projects in the coming years, um, they're going to have to build a bridge next to it while traffic still goes over that and then they'll eventually tear that down. So this is going to create havoc uh, for the local community. And who knows what it's going to be like for all the traffic. I already mentioned how many trucks go through there. Uh, this is going to be a nightmare. The project needs to be done, but this is going to be a nightmare uh, once the work actually starts. Um, in like Chicago, uh, they're the Joliet uh, High School teachers, uh, this is from the NAT action that they conducted. You know, as all these, Joliet gives away all these tax breaks, they're not able to create a contract with their teachers. Um, so there's been labor unrest uh, in the city as, um, you know, part of the consequence of uh, such generous tax breaks for this development. This is the Joliet Splash Station. Uh, there's, a, there's a referendum on the ballot to increase property taxes to keep this open. The voters said, we don't agree with that. And part of the consequence of that was the public uh, water park was closed. The kids are devastated. Um, but beyond that, you know, the park districts also had to furlough workers and lay people off or uh, get early retirement you know, as the, the city hasn't uh, gotten uh, the taxes that were promised. So this is a picture um, of uh, our march that we, we hosted a People's Climate Movement event uh, last year. And we uh, we were invited by the people of Elwood who've heard uh, all these stories about the problems with warehouses. Uh, and they were concerned about local pollution from all the freight uh, that goes through the area. 8% of the local population has asthma. There's a direct correlation between diesel pollution and diesel particulate and that uh, contributing to the phenomenon. It's not the only reason, but it is a contributing factor. So they are concerned about local health. We are concerned about jobs. They are concerned about uh, transportation to become the uh, largest contributor to climate change in our state, in the country now, uh, and freight, this international uh, uh, port uh, represents a huge contribution to the problem. Uh, so we came together and we marched uh, uh, together down to the BNSF yard and said, we want better deals for our communities, we want better deals for our workers, we want to get rid of the staffing agencies, uh, and we want you to take care of our environment uh, while you're at it. So uh, this, this last portion uh, that we'll get into is going to talk about the, you know, really the elephant in the room and the, the biggest player um, is, you know, Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Uh, so you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to think long term. You have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. Jeff Bezos. Um, so you see here in um, Amazon in uh, 2013, there's 44 facilities. So in the Midwest, they concentrated their warehouses in place where they got favorable sales tax arrangements. Uh, so that was in Indiana and Kentucky. So that's the only place in uh, 2013 where these warehouses existed. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling came down, uh, said, you know, e-commerce wasn't going to be able to get these tax breaks. Uh, forever, they have to start paying taxes too, and we've seen uh, their network really change. Um, the first Amazon in the state of Illinois was built in 2015 in Joliet, um, and since uh, since 2015 in Will County, uh, Amazon's ground five. They're about to uh, build a six warehouse 
Uh, they're not only the largest warehouse employer in Will County, which is over 8,000 workers, they're the largest employer of any employer uh, in that area. So that's, and that's from 2015 to 2019. They've grown that quickly in four years. And there's no sign of the growth slowing down. It's exponential. Um, and we see is the, re the retail apocalypse, right? 5,000 stores closed last year. Uh, they're predicting even more this year. Um, so where if those jobs aren't necessarily disappearing, that there be, these are becoming warehouse jobs. They're becoming delivery drivers. Uh, this is where the economy's shifting is to e-commerce. Um, so 27 non-sortable fulfillment centers, 11 sortable fulfillment centers, 34 sortable fulfillment centers, 12 specialty fulfillment centers. That, that number is growing. Um, a lot of the a lot of the warehouses are becoming becoming more streamlined, where you have um, you know a closed warehouse or you'll have a small electronic warehouse. So we we see more specialization where. Uh, it used to be like sort of everything went through. So we see that their network is changing. Six redistrib redistribution centers, 41 prime hubs, 20, 32 sortation centers, 26 delivery station. That number is also going to grow quickly. Um, three return centers, 19 Amazon fresh centers. And we you know about the acquisition of Whole Foods. So this is the old model uh, for Amazon. So you have the supplier go to the fulfillment center, and then uh, all their deliveries were done by third-party logistics companies, UPS, FedEx, the post office, to the customer. This was entirely their model. Um, we've seen this change, and, and why did it change? Um, part of it is that they weren't, a, you know, part of the, the only real advantage retail has uh, over e-commerce is really this instant gratification, right? You go into a brick and mortar store, you buy something, you feel good, oh, I got my thing. Yeah. Amazon wants to be able to replicate that, but they're frustrated by their suppliers being able to get things to people on time. Uh, so they've, they've invested a lot of money um, into uh, creating this new system um, where they're, they're doing more and more and more uh, direct deliveries, especially in places where it's profitable, uh, like Chicago, where there's a big market and you can displace UPS and other third-party logistics companies. Uh, in a rural area, you might see more dependency on the post office and less of this direct delivery by Amazon. Um, Reggie Miller, Joe. Uh. Amazon redistribution centers. So uh, I mentioned that about Walmart. Uh, the the redistribution center is in Joliet in this region. Uh, and, as in a, and as I kind of mentioned before, is that that's the one that you know makes the whole network. So if you were able to organize workers uh, in these six specific geographies. These, these are the exact workplaces that you need to be able to organize, to be able to shut down the entire network. So the theory is, is if you know, labor can get into these specific regions, these are the place where potential union organizing and building of worker power could have the most effect. Because <coughs> if, if we weren't able to get uh, what we wanted, we could, we could shut down the, uh, the network. So delivery. Amazon Flex, you know, we see we see a lot of um, yeah. So we, we see a lot of the Lyft, the um, you know these uh, uh, gig economy things. And Amazon's definitely a part of that and has that in their infrastructure. Uh, so if you go to the uh, delivery station one in Chicago, you'll see fleets of personal owned vehicles. What you'll see, it, it, you can if you're ever driving in the morning, you can stop by there, but you also see these hundreds of vans lining up to be loaded, for, and you see those vans all over the street. Well, there's there's probably 12 separate uh, companies that work out of uh, the Amazon delivery station. They don't hire directly drivers, especially. Uh, there's a great New York Times article that talked about Amazon 
uh, drivers being involved in fatalities. There's been a couple in Chicago, but none of those were Amazon workers. They work either for Amazon Flex or for a contracted out delivery company. Don't Shoot the Messenger is one, Scoobies. There's all kinds of them, but there's, there's a, a dozen on uh, different delivery companies that do the last mile delivery. Um, and you see Amazon incorporate this uh, contracting out, especially in their driving workforce. Uh, it's delivery with Amazon. Um, and as I, as I kind of mentioned, you know, we, I, the delivery driving, we, we see a lot of the most the lawlessness, a lot of the contracting out and avoidance of responsibility. Yeah, you know, UPS uh, driver is going to make at least $25, $30 an hour. But beyond that, they're also going to have, uh, you know, they're very rigorous about how they train their drivers because it's a dangerous job uh, and one of the most dangerous jobs. But you see this sort of free for all from the Amazon uh, network. Um, so I, I kind of mentioned, uh, the, and this, this is growing, there's 12 facilities in Chicago Metro one redistribution center, two sortation centers, one large non-sortable facility, three small sortables, one Amazon Fresh, one Amazon Prime Hub, that one's in Goose Island, uh, three delivery stations, third largest Amazon market is Chicago, of course. So uh, not only is this a strategic um, place just to be as far as the way our transportation and logistics work, it's also a huge market for Amazon to be in. Um, so one of the collaborations we've, yeah, I kind of mentioned us working with uh, different partners, and um, one of the um, one of the collaborations we've taken on is really taken on the climate justice uh, angle to all of this. So via match, I mentioned transportation is um, the biggest contributor to climate change. This enormous network of Amazon delivery vehicles and logistics is creating a ton of pollution, um, as you can see. So 19.1 million tons of carbon in our atmosphere. So we've, we've worked in a coalition of groups, including Amazon tech workers, uh, to campaign for a climate plan from Jeff Bezos. So uh, this is from the uh, global climate strike. Uh, these are Amazon tech workers who told Jeff Bezos, you know, like we want to have a healthy, livable planet. Uh, and we want you to do something about it. Uh, and they walked off their job. Uh, it was a labor action for climate change. I've never heard of this before. Uh, Warehouse Workers for Justice was working in collaboration with this group and other groups around the country. Uh, this is an action uh, during the global climate strike uh, at the Amazon headquarters in Chicago, uh, where we also delivered the same message. We want a real climate plan and we did not get everything we wanted, but during this movement moment, the global climate strike was the biggest protest since the start of the Iraq war. Uh, we saw that Jeff Bezos rolled out with a climate plan. He said he's going to reduce carbon footprint uh, 80% uh, by 2024. They're building 100,000 electric vehicles. Um, those are going to be built partially in Illinois in an Illinois-based uh, car. Uh, delivery vehicle manufacturers. So, um, you know, this is to point out that organizing really can work, and it's all it's very important to focus our efforts on people who are able to set the uh, conditions of our workforce and other issues too. We we were able to get move Amazon and um, you know make a real plan on climate change. We did it. We won, um, and we can get other companies to follow that lead. Uh, so that, that's part of our inspiration. Um, and in the words of Jeff Bezos, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to think long term. You have to be willing to be understood for long periods of time. So we're going to use that as our organizing model as we try to change transportation and logistics and uh, the current conditions of warehouse jobs. They used to be good, great jobs. Uh, and we want to see that return to, to the warehouse. Uh, so lastly, I want to end on a positive note. Uh, when we organize, we do win. Um, Elwood said no to North Point. Uh, the community did win. David and Goliath. And David won. At least uh, 
want to know, uh, lab, this is last November, Joey had voted uh, no to new, two new staffing agencies. We're gonna continue our campaign <coughs> to say, these staffing agencies have got to go. It's ridiculous, people aren't even directly employed by uh, the likes of Walmart and Home Depot that this, this work arrangement has sent. And, and you think of a staffing agency, uh, we did a study, the, the average length of a placement at a staffing agency is for three years. Uh, it's not this 90-day thing or 60-day thing. People get stuck in perpetuity uh, in staffing agency jobs. So we're, we're making some progress there. Uh, the IKEA warehouse uh, went union with the International Association of Machinists uh, this past June. So two of the warehouses went union. Um, we we won, um, you know, we're part of the climate campaign and we got Jeff Bezos to make a real plan. Uh, on climate, we have more to do on that front, but you know, we got something done. So that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Yeah, so, um, yeah, a lot of good stuff there. Are you willing to uh, questions? Yeah, okay, let's uh, do we need a moderator up there? Can you call on people yourself? Okay, start off, uh, Gene. Uh, could you define or redefine intermobile? So that's a good question. So an in intermodal, the literal meaning is uh, different modes of transportation. Uh, so it, that's that's changing transportation, right? From a, from a train to a truck, uh, you get boats to to you know unload it on the train. That's that's an in intermodal. So that's that's a literal meaning. Container. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Container. Next, please. Does the. Uh Warehouse workers for justice support physical violence against strike breakers. Yeah. And do they support intimidation to those uh, resistant to organization? I mean, so uh, during the 2012, because we, we, we have been a part of a strike in 2012, and it was a peaceful protest. Um, so they, you know, we didn't use any of those tactics. We used civil disobedience. We blocked the streets. Some people got arrested. So that's 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 been our only experience with strikes was in 2012. Okay. Does your your does your organization represent some of the warehouse workers and some of the older businesses like Edward Don and Company? Can you? Know, Edward Don, I you know we. Um, we don't represent, you know, because we're, we're, we're a worker center, we're a nonprofit, not a union. Um, there's still a good amount of warehouses that do have s some unionization. Uh, the uh, the I IAM, the machinists, have a lot of shops. UAW still has shops. Uh, the UE has some shops. So uh, we're, we've mostly been focused on the non organized workers and, you know, people in the worst conditions. Could you repeat the question so everyone can hear? My question to you is, I, always, I thought you were a union, but you just mentioned that you're not a union. Right? Yeah. So what, what, what's the difference between you and a union? Mm -hmm. Well, we, we believe in unions and uh, we support unions, uh, but we were kind of created in the absence of labor being, like there's no unions practically speak, there's a few, there's a handful. There's not there's not any unions in any of these Will County warehouses. Uh, but we're able to we're be able to help workers with enforce their rights. We're able to get them free legal services. We're able to educate them. We're able to pass policies that uh, um, you know regulate the staffing agencies and things like that. So you said you were non profit and you sounds like you're doing everything a union would do but you're not a union we're not a union but you're doing everything a union would do why do you choose not to be a union it's there's you know there's um i mean there there are unions who we work closely with on this that and we even refer uh workers who want to unionize to unions but it's you know, we see ourselves as expanding the, oh, the labor movement, you know, being able to do things. You know, we worked on a, uh, you know, over 100 um, black workers got fired at this Walmart warehouse earlier this year, and we helped them organize a campaign against Walmart. Well, they're already fired, so there's no incentive to unionize. Their union would never get involved because they want to 
be able to organize the workplace, but this was not something that was going to lead to an NL, NLR re-election. So we're able to do something for these workers uh, that a union, frankly, like wouldn't want to do because there's not a chance at organizing them at that because they already been fired. If that makes sense, I mean, I, I understand your question, but I, you know, we're we're able to fill in where unions aren't doing work. You know, is how I would answer. Charlie in the back. Okay. Charlie. Yeah, Roberto, you said three guys out of 800 spoke in favor of the warehouse at in Elwood rally. Do you think those three guys were libertarians and anti -workers? No, they were actually trade unionist members. Um, the warehouses are built union. Uh, they get project labor agreements with the developers, which means that uh, as part of the uh, zoning deal uh, with the city wherever they're uh, developing it. Uh, they'll make sure that uh, the, the people building the, the warehouses are union jobs. Uh, so the, the unions have um, financial incentive in some of these warehouses. And, and it, as I mentioned earlier too, uh, unions and retirees have a direct connection through pension funds. Our big investors uh, in these logistics facilities. CalPERS is in, uh, it's LaSalle Trust are the two owners of the largest uh, intermodal and uh, port, inland port in the, the country. You know, so, you know, there's, there's some elements of labor who are very pro uh, these projects, but the, the warehouses themselves are vehemently anti-labor, so I, I feel like there's a contradiction there. Are you familiar with uh, the concept of data centers and switching centers for infrastructure on the internet? Uh, yeah. Building, building, getting buildings that large. In yeah. There? You know, on Amazon. You know, Amazon's Amazon's fifty percent of uh, the e-commerce market, but a lot of their um, a lot of their business is actually data services and cloud services, and actually running the internet. You know, these data centers are are a part of that. So. Uh, some of these companies that we deal with are, are part of this this market that you mentioned. That's, that's like less of our thing, but we, we no, know a little bit Because the it. reason I mention it is because in a lot of places like Joliet and where they have the large warehouse buildings, a lot of those buildings are not warehouses but computer server farms. Yeah. And I mean, are you familiar with, with that part of the... I'm a little familiar, like I mentioned, but I'm, you know, that's not... And there, there's a lot to, to know about... Um, in, in this, uh, as, as you can see, I mean, this, this is our, our, you know, we're we're at a, this is the one of the centers of our global economy. Um, and when, okay. Uh, yeah. So with the staffing agency model, where you have several staffing agencies in between the company and the and workers, like what are some differences or challenges to organizing those workers under that model, and how would you even go about like negotiating a contract, for instance? Yeah, the, the, you know, I, at the end of the day, I, I think that the, you know, that that would be one of our goals is, um, you know, I think the staffing agency uh, models, you know, completely oppressive, and uh, you know, it's, it, it it gains employers, um, uh, you know, regulatory avoidance uh, is, is what I would um, characterize the that model as being, um, whereas you know. People with criminal records. Um, one of the auspices for not hiring people directly into the warehouse might be because someone's criminal background. And a staffing agency allows uh, people from that demographic to still be employed, but for less money and uh, you no, know, you know, benefits and things like that. So, you know, I think that the industry needs to be highly regulated or better regulated. We we do we were a part of passing the strongest law. Uh, in the country, um, you know, but enforcing, I mean, really enforcing basic labor rights, I think it's a part of uh, this, but also, you know, uh, getting uh, more staffing agency employees into our organization is, is, is vitally important. Okay. Do, do, do you think, do, do you think the warehouse will ever use uh, driverless trucks and drones? You know, so there's a report that came out uh, this week that talked about automation, and I think we need to think about automation a bit more broadly than just robots taking over our jobs. Like that, 
I think that is a possibility, but um, Amazon's a great example where uh, you got the scanners, uh, you got the algorithms telling you what to do, uh, you have the surveillance, they know everything that's going on. Well, that, in a certain sense, that's automation, right? This, this, these, are, these are automized systems uh, contributing to how you work. So we think that you, in, um, in Will County, the workforce for warehousing is over 24,000. Uh, workers and we, we see it still growing. Uh, we think the, the immediate effect is that the automation is forcing people to work at faster paces and harder, but we do see the possibility of um, there being more automation. The, the IKEA warehouse that I mentioned, it's massive, 1.5 million square feet, but um, you know, between, between that and another IKEA warehouse, that workforce is only about 150 workers, because that's an auto, uh, automated warehouse. So we do see signs that, and we, you know, Amazon um, figured out a way to uh, package through automation, and you know that that reduced the number of workers that were involved with that. So we do, we do see signs of it. The, the driving cars. I mean, I think we're a bit, I think we're off from that a bit, but I, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on automation either. <laughs> Head in the back, Charlie again. Yeah, Roberto, I read some time ago that in the warehouses that you're not filling orders quickly enough. That you have everybody wears these computer things, and an alarm will go off and give you an electric shock or something like that. Yeah, they don't shock you. But yeah, no, I mean, there's. You know, like at Amazon, they have a, a rate system, and they, they track everything you do, and then if you're not meeting your quota, um, you can get punished. And if, you know, you don't meet rate or uh, satisfy, um, you know, what they want, you know, you'll be fired at a certain point. So I just, I feel like there's this growing sophistication of how they keep track of uh, what people are doing at work. I, you know, I think that's... Uh, the phenomenon, but there's, you know, there's also, um, you know, I feel like some of the working conditions in warehouses, there's this, it's like a Kafka novel where, you know, people, you know, we have these Amazon workers and they'll get fired for not filling their rate, you know, but then they'll get hired, hired back because the labor market's actually so tight now. Um, you know, like, we had a, you know, back in when Walmart was more of our focus, it wouldn't be unusual for um, a, a warehouse worker to get staffed by one staffing agency, get fired, go to another staffing agency, and get sent back to Walmart doing the exact same thing. And we've had people go through four or five different staffing agencies and be fired at them and then like go right back to the same warehouse just at another staffing agency. Yeah. So there's like, there's this absurdity to, um, the employment arrangement uh, in these warehouses. Um, this is a vague memory. Did Amazon pay their warehouse people 15 an hour? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And do they, does Amazon hire directly, It's which is different from the Walmart model? That I would say, you know, so Yes, they did do fifteen dollars an hour, and that that has been helpful. Um, we have seen that, and I, the the labor market's really tight um, in Will County. So, kind of the combination of the fifteen dollars an hour uh, and a tight labor market has pushed wages up. You know, it's like we're hearing of people even making like eighteen, nineteen dollars an hour in some warehouses that aren't union. Um, so, uh, that that was a positive. Um, I would say. Um, there are problems with it because they took away, um, people had stock options and things like that and they're not giving that to new employees and that, that actually hurt some of them. Um, so uh, the, the people who already had it were grandfathered in, but people hired after the $15 don't get that stock option anymore. Uh, so we've heard some uh, negative um, feedback on that. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the second one? The other one, one was, um is Amazon a direct hire model? Okay, yeah. They, so I would say um, they haven't been as elaborate, at least in their warehouses, with this um, subcontracting as Walmart. 
but like especially like right now during the busy season we will see um, they their preferred staffing agencies integrity staffing uh, so we'll see an influx uh, right now they got they got this um, self scheduling thing that you can do too uh, that those are direct hires um, but one of the some of the feedback we heard about that is that um, you know, kind of after the busy seasons, it can be hard. Like, it doesn't really work. Like, come January, you're not, like, you can self-schedule right now, but come January, you won't have access to work, um, which is an issue. I would say where we really see the contracting out is with their last mile delivery services. That's where you see last mile delivery services, so, like, their delivery stations. Like, and that's, that's where you'll see, like, the Amazon Flex, and like all these various contract out uh, uh, delivery companies, and that's that's where I feel like you see some of the precarious workforce. But I, I think they they do have more direct yeah. hires than Mall has. The the old main post office still has a lot of room available. You think the warehouse might go? It's not an ideal location. You think the warehouse might? Be yeah, isn't isn't Lyft going there? Or they they're going to have their corporate well, office. They got nine. I used to work there 51 yeah. years. They got a yeah. lot of space there. Yeah, I mean, I can. I, warehousing. I mean, I, I, warehousing is coming back to the city, and that's that's a trend we're going to uh, continue to see. I think a Cranes article said there is um, like 19.1 million square feet of uh, like the light manufacturing, but it's predominantly warehousing, and that's just in 2018. And the, I. I only see the market growing and demand growing. So if that that building was, you know, turned into some logistics or warehousing operation, and I, I wouldn't be shocked. If we're d uh, lowering on questions, if there's no, no other questions, we can go to rebuttals early tonight. Everybody can have enough time. Yeah. We can get out of here early tonight too. If people don't feel like giving a lot of rebuttal, yeah. so it's up to you guys. How, how many people want to give a rebuttal? One. Two, two rebuttals, three, or well, everybody gets 20 minutes in, right? No. <laughs> we'll go five we'll minutes go, each. We'll try, and try five or six minutes a piece. Um, give our speaker a hand. Thank you. Yay. All right, let's uh, go into rebuttals now. Okay, we're going to start the main rebuttal period. Uh, and we'll, we'll, just, we'll, we'll start with five minutes a piece. Uh, come on up, that should be. I don't think I can take five minutes, but I went to a Labor Notes workshop that was held at CTU. And um, at this workshop, there was a young man who has worked in an Amazon Fulfillment Center for three years. And I was amazed that he could stand this job for three years. But it was, I wish I could recreate it better. I can't because it's a three-dimensional situation that he tried to explain to us in two dimensions. But there's, you know, these moving belts that have packages on them with zebra, uh, zebra uh, indicators that give you a SKU. Um, and it and they go here they go there and it doesn't take very many workers it was a really really amazing presentation of what happens in these fulfillment centers it's like packages are up there and then there's some down here and then they go in there and somehow the machine knows whether they go there or there and uh, anyway i I was astonished by that, but uh, the talk tonight has been just excellent, something I was not aware of at all, and I really, really appreciate being here and getting to hear this. It was a super talk, and um, along with the one I heard at Labor Notes Workshop, it's just, it, this is such new stuff, and it's really, really, really interesting and very frightening, uh, although um, it, it just reminds me of any kind of an industrial revolution, you know, like the invention of the wheel, that must have really 
discombobulated everybody for a couple of centuries. So this is really something new that's hard to hard to um, take in. I have always thought that people who subscribe to Amazon Prime had to be absolutely crazy. And when I walk into Whole Foods, I think, um, I just can't pay more for uh, an item when somebody behind me in line is paying less. So I have to avoid all of those items at Whole Foods where people with Amazon Prime get a discount. And I think, and of course maybe it's because of my age and because I can't take in this new uh, regime, but I think people are being captured by this um, this system and uh, it's going to be really a big surprise to a lot of people when um, when the comeuppance comes for how this is going to affect our lives. So anyway, uh, this talk just opened my eyes like nothing else. very interesting. Um, uh, there's a lot of that railroads. Chicago was uh, mentioned as a big hub for railroads. It's also a big hub for intersecting um, interstate highways. Uh, so if we want to reduce sprawl and reduce pollution, I think the best way to do that is to privatize the interstate highway system. <laughs> and uh, stop subsidizing big business uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, in addition to you know tax breaks for big, big business, we, have, we should give them to, tax breaks to all businesses, not just the big ones. That's more fair. I think that'll stimulate uh, the economy and it'd be made for a much more ideal labor uh, situation. Thank you. There is a hidden cost to e-commerce as well. Because in the past, when you went to a small business, if you didn't like something out of the return, you usually knew the merchant. And you usually knew the person that uh, you were buying from. Today, in a lot of cases, that's not the case. You see, when Amazon comes in and they start, uh, you start shipping with them, if you have a particular product, that you're very good at selling, all of a sudden you're booming with it. What Amazon does is after a while, they start circumventing the thing and they try to buy the product direct from where you're getting it. And then they go into direct competition with you. At the same time, with all this handling of freight, let's face it, a lot of stuff does get damaged. And I take it too that uh, it's all done for the convenience of the American consumer. Well, to be honest with you, sometimes I believe that the American consumer is some of the most spoiled brats in the United States. I mean, um, what you, you know, some of these companies that ship stuff out, there's over 20% returns on some of the items. And there's a number of businesses, they just buy Amazon returns and uh, clean them up and reship them out again. There's a friend of mine who, uh, has a place called Sunday Seconds that does this. Um, I know another uh, bunch of electronics refurbishing places that uh, take the old electronics, refurbish them, and then reship them out again. Uh, I recently walked into Fry's Electronics not too long and was amazed to see that most of their shelves aren't as stocked as they used to be. And they said, what happened? Well, we're having trouble and we're switching logistics partners to get our stuff back in for Christmas. To me, it's amazing what has happened with the amount of automation and the amount of integration that we've had in just the last 15 to 20 years, especially with the development of the internet. Uh, I do support 
a lot of the things. I like the innovation that's going on in the IT field. I like the fact that things are getting cheaper to deliver because it does help keep prices down and spreads the good news of globalization worldwide along with free trade, which I think has been the biggest benefit to almost everybody around. Um, what I don't like is corporate welfare. And when a company comes in and gets 20 years of tax abatements, and then a local community cannot benefit from that tax base, that to me is even worse than what you hear with some of these conservatives saying about the welfare queens and all this stuff. You know, because when you're talking 90 some billion dollars in tax breaks, that's a lot of money that you're going to the local community. And as a matter of fact, one of Walmart's models was they would come into a community, build a big superstore, maybe get five years of tax abatements, then the abatements would run out, then they'd move out and build another store in a community that gave the same tax abatements. And then that whole warehouse and store would sit empty. There have been several instances where I know they used to have a store called Home Base out in Palatine, Illinois. That's what happened to it. It was sold to a local Christian church for a buck, and it's now uh, a big mega church out in uh, Arlington Heights. They did the same thing to a couple of other corporate headquarters. I think they still buildings and, and facilities have been put to good use. <coughs> but there are just some things that you know need to be economized. They've also said that there's far more delivery vehicles on the road now than there ever was making individual deliveries. Um, I have a number of friends who I work with on a weekend stay do DoorDash and Uber and everything else, and it's a great second income for them. But they say they don't have any time with their families because you know, they work a regular full-time job, and then they have to supplement their income to make ends meet. Fortunately, I haven't had to do that myself because I do like my time off, and I do like volunteering for my organizations and things. And I've been able to get at least enough to, to get by to live off of. I just don't think, though, that you want to go on strike or stop the automation because when, it was, when they tried to do it in the 1800s, you know, they just couldn't, you know, what happened, you know, when they had all that cotton in there. People started buying more clothes and getting more things done and the, the general overall economy went up. Now, don't forget, with all this logistics, things that come in, there are another numerous jobs that are also generated. Not only the warehouse workers and the truck drivers, but you also have the call centers. You also have people who've got to maintain the servers and equipment. And what you guys may not realize is that there's quite a bit of infrastructure involved in the internet itself. Um, if you look at a place out in downtown Franklin Park, it's called Digital Realty. It used to be an old, I think an old steel plant or something down there. They've now got six seven buildings about the size of these warehouses and there's no truck traffic. What they used was the big electrical infrastructure for this old plant and put up these data centers and all they are is nothing but computers to try to store the data. You go out to Nevada, I'm, and I'm sorry, Washington State where they used to have a lot of industry where they had like aluminum smelters and uh, some of the big natural resource plants out there. They're all getting converted to data centers. And about 7% of our electric rates, our electric power around the world is just used to run the basic internet infrastructure. The benefit is this. We all have a smartphone. We have all the most instantaneous information at our fingertips. And you know, in a lot of cases, I think it's cool to have a lot of this stuff available and ready to go. But at the same time, we're also sacrificing our own privacy because Everything you do is now brought in by some company. One of the largest is something called AXICOM, Hexacom. And I believe they're one of the largest. They, have, they know more about you than having to run a security clearance with the government. In fact, a lot of times the government subcontracts with them just to do a routine background check on you. They'll know what you purchase. They'll know what, you, what your habits are. Google keeps your online searches for years. Um, but again, the internet is still a new technology, as well as other things. But we'll learn to live with it. You know, sometimes it'll take 20 to 30 years to really integrate it in. And then, of course, you know, what used to be free on television, you now pay for.
but you also have a lot more choice and a lot more programming than you ever had in your whole life. Anyway, I could go on and on. Bottom line is I support globalization. I support free trade. I don't like corporate welfare, nor, I mean, you do need a social safety net for a lot of things like that. And also, too, people do have to make a fair wage for what they do. And if a company gets so big and so fat that they're going to treat their workers like hell, is it really worth having these large corporations? I mean, you know, maybe Teddy Roosevelt got it right when he started trust busting because that's stifled competition everywhere. <coughs> anyway, enough said. Thank you. Well, let's go. Let's see you guys. <laughs> Are you pro worker? I'm pro. Other guy. I'm pro capitalist. Yeah. yeah. I'm pro capitalist. Yeah. Yes. What they need is term limits, Charlie. That's some uh, tonight is uh, one of those examples of where sometimes I have no problems uh, with the speaker, and you know, we have problems with what Tim says. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's actually there there's a lot that I actually agree with. Uh, I'm not really big on uh, on world markets because it's not a, it's not a, an even playing field. You have the United States has all these protective laws for the environment for workers, and uh, you can easily corporations can just walk across the international border and find some place to exploit uh, uh, the workers, the government, the environment, uh, the natural resources. It's um, it's a completely unfair playing field. Uh, it, it's it doesn't it seems like free trade doesn't really deal with freedoms. Um, so just a couple of kind of ideas that came up while uh, the speaker was speaking. I guess I can first say that the presentation was just terrific. Yeah. Very taking a uh, complicated topic and, right. and, uh, and making it so it's very clear to understand the industry and how it's affecting people. I, I think it's really terrific. I, and, and I oh, yeah. best of luck with, you, with fighting good the good guy. fight. Um, there was, uh, right uh, when you talked about how the trucking hand was yeah. destroying yeah. the, uh, basically, yeah. the infrastructure yeah. of these uh, local communities, uh, it made me think of a couple of things that I'd heard in the media about trucking. I'd always heard uh, uh, a number of times how the trucking is industry complains because they're getting taxed at an unfair rate. Um, they're, they're only a fraction of the vehicles on the road, and yet they pay this huge fee. and. Um, and I also heard something interesting that were uh, these uh, trucks um, on the other side of the coin, the trucks tend to uh, wear down the roads at an immensely larger rate than an automobile. So I just thought, well, instead of talking about my ass, I should look it up. And I went online, found a bunch of sources that were pretty consistent. One truck, uh, trucks are allowed to carry up to 80,000 pounds of, uh, of weight. Uh, one truck it, uh, causes the same wear as uh, up to 10,000 vehicles. So um, uh, now also it was saying that uh, trucks are about 10% of the, the vehicles on the road, but they pay 35% of the taxes. The problem is, is they cause 99% of the road wear. So just imagine you have these massive trucks. Now those are also, it was saying, those are if the trucks stay under the legal limit. There are a lot of trucks that overload, so you have these uh, these intermodals where you have these containers coming overseas, you really don't know how much they're wearing. Uh, if, they're, if they wear even more, they cause a tremendous amount of damage. The, uh, uh, any additional weight per axle, it causes damage uh, to the power of four, <coughs> which is like crazy. So uh, this is really a backdoor uh, subsidy for corporations. They don't have to pay for this. There's a tremendous cost to pave the roads for these trucks so the corporations can make money. And who pays for it? The poor people who also have to pay for their schools. Schools for their kids. These companies, these, these small communities that are, I didn't realize that Elwood and uh, uh, 
what were the other? Uh, Peoria. Uh, Peoria? Uh, what year? Pardon? Romeoville. Romeoville, yeah. It's like that, that there were $30 million in debt. I was like, that, that's shocking to me. Um, Bolingbroke was $300 million? I never heard this. This is just, this is incredible. And, but it makes sense because I've been down to Midwin and I've seen it's just constant trucks. You're in the middle of nowhere. And there's just truck after truck after truck after truck. You're like, holy crap. And I've been through Elwood. It's at this tiny little community, a little tiny two block long downtown area where only half, where half the stores aren't really used. And, but it's cute. And uh, it's really just a shame to hear the story. And I, and I really uh, uh, I applaud you for your work. And uh, thanks for coming. Okay. All right, next. All right, I guess I. Uh, All right, Charlie. Force me to. Oh. All right, let's thank uh, Roberto, Mr. Clark. Thank you, and thank you for your efforts. On behalf of organized labor, I'll be eclectic as usual. You're answering a question at these operating, uh, more generally called worker centers. Uh, they had these, they still exist. Uh, um, Rise Up is the one that's major in Chicago. They uh, found a little niche uh, in between Oregon and the, and the employment world for people who didn't qualify for uh, union membership sometimes. Uh, so the worker centers. And also Taft-Hartley has very rigid rules on what unions can do, which was passed to constrain unions. They cannot engage in boycotts, secondary boycotts, things of that nature. And they can be charged. Uh, so the worker centers found a little niche. The farm workers uh, are probably the best example. Uh, under Chavez, uh, see he had a nationwide boycott, which unions were not, not permitted to, to engage in. So here's the best example. These worker centers take up specific issues, multi-unions, and lay the groundwork often for the unions to come in. Uh, let's see. Uh, this joint employer, um, I didn't do a lot of hands-on organizing as a union representative. Actually, the elections that I held were not particularly contested. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of the organizing drives I did, the employer, there was no election and the employer simply recognized the union because I signed up all the employees as members. Sure. This, this practice is very common in China, where you go through a hiring, uh, a third, a, a, another party. The employer does not hire anybody directly. They go through these hiring corporations and therefore any concerns regarding working conditions go to the hiring corporation or any violations. Or it, that's what I mean, it's a loophole. It's a thing, and, and uh, this shows you how the capitalists operate internationally, and they do the same thing here, and they do that in third world countries. And Trump has facilitated the, 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 that this practice take place in the United States. Uh, you know, talk about beating up a few scabs and cross the picket line. Yeah, that's a good idea. When they place their own self, if you place your own personal interest above that of the community, you should be punished. You should be disciplined. Because your attitude is, you, you're placing your self personal importance above anyone else. And you don't care what harm might result to others as a result of your actions, as long as your number one concern is yourself. And anybody who advances this philosophy has got some problems, because one of the branches of philosophies, one of the major ones, is something called ethics. And ethics does not uh, facilitate that thing. Um, as a matter of fact, I represented, where, where else? employees at one time. 
Uh, I remember we had one grievances. I had one grievance. There, there was a guy in the middle. Was uh, there were three employees, and the guy in the middle was given a very bad rating on his performance of processing uh, packages. Now there was an employee. I do. I did some research, and I found out the employee, the guy in front of him, uh, got an outstanding rating. And the guy on the other side of him got an outstanding rating, but the guy in the middle of this line got a bad rating. And I said, well, how could that be? You know, uh, did he hold up the thing in any way? No, uh, it couldn't be possible because the overall distribution, the work of this line was outstanding. So it was inconceivable how there could be a bad boy anywhere on the line I won the grievance. Actually, the only other major achievement I did, I never thought that very much of it. One of the things I wanted in the, uh, talk about what employees want, simple things, the great demands, you know. They wanted a cafeteria. I didn't really ever, I, I, just, I, I just discussed it with the employer and went over some details and looked it up to them and uh, I never really thought that much about it, but they simply wanted a cafeteria to have lunch. Uh, have a place that they could bring their own lunch and microwave and things like this. I, you know, simple little requests like that. I don't know why you needed the intersection of employee representative or something, or why the employer is not responsive. And I understand it. I said, why don't I get it here? Why don't we get, find some room for it and get some tables, whatever, you know. Anyhow, they were, they were really, Entirely grateful to me. They thought that was just tremendous. I mean, I had, I had what, a cafeteria? I never really thought about it. It's just a standard feature of many workplaces in the United States. The thing about the intermodal growth, uh, amazingly enough, that one line, the Berlin BNFSF, that's their main, that's one of the major used lines. You're asking what intermodal is, and maybe he didn't quite give you an answer. That's what, those are the big containers, 42 foot or longer containers that replaced the box car. See, the railroads came along and they originally all had box cars. Then they, uh, they tried piggyback service. The Chicago Great Western Railroad, as a matter of fact, here, put a trailer on a, on a flat car. They had two of those. And that was the beginning of intermodal because it goes on both the train and the highway. Somebody said, let's just use containers, and they standardize it, so it goes by sea, uh, by rail, and then by road. And it has changed transportation altogether. Uh, you have these well cars, where they stack two of them, uh, and it replaces box cars. And then at the other end, you don't really need a lot of infrastructure. I, there's one right by my house. You can unload uh, containers using just, they have to be fairly powerful, but just large forklifts mm -hmm. can take those containers off and deposit them on the spine, spine truck, they call it. Uh, it's just a very framework, on, it's a trailer truck. And then it's off and scoots to its delivery. And uh, there's not a lot, that's what I mean. The, the thing about the amazing thing is the uh, yard by my house is not large it's, and there's a significant amount of container things, but the actual territory it covers, the operation didn't require much investment either on the other end, so you can see its approach. The, uh, the thing about the Burlington, the amazing thing is that one line he showed, rail line, is the southwest line of the southwest chief, and they're carrying incredible amounts of, you stand by that line, I've stood by the line in different portions, and there's a train every 15, 20 minutes or so, sometimes 100, or at least 100 or more trains per day, and we're talking significant trains, 124 or more cars of these containers, uh, easily, one after another, all day long, continuous, and <laughs> that's the same route that they were claiming they couldn't run the super chief for some reason. You know, I said, come on, you've got plenty of things for the 
containers, but yeah, we all oh, there's issues with the the super chief down in the southwest of LA from Chicago. But this is ridiculous, you know. And last of all, Amy, is uh, I'll be coming out with I used to put out a, for the Chicago Greens, the Green Guide to the Holidays, huh. and we really don't need all this stuff. <laughs> I assure you, this rampant consumerism later in life, I I personally in my house, nothing comes in unless something goes out. Uh, we don't need this stuff. If you don't look at it in a year or wear it in a year, or use it in a year, uh, we have material abundance beyond anyone's imagination or need. Uh, take a serious look at some of this stuff. There's no compelling need. I've been to this Target store as many years as we've been here. I've been there exactly once actually shopping for something in which I bought something in probably five years. That's just not part of my orientation towards the world. Matter of fact, when I do go, the last time I really was in a big box store, I was looking around. It was, I said, you know, this is amazing, you know. But I do remark that if I own the entire store, I probably could just give it away. I don't, I don't really want any of, any of that thing. But anyhow, thanks, Roberto. Come back some time and report on progress and what's going on. The workforce is ever changing. You've got to respond to it. Uh, these uh, one other warehouse story I will tell. This was also kind of a manufacturing facility, but what happened when it was in the middle of the summer and it was very very hot. It was one of these large buildings, and I still remember they had automated equipment, robotic, and the employees got upset and there was all sorts of trouble that ensued because they brought in fans and the employer put the fans on the robots and the automated equipment instead of the employees because they said the equipment was more valuable. <laughs> All right. You get the last word, Roberto? That's capitalism. If there's no other way, oh, I'm sorry. She had missed a couple minutes earlier, so follow up. I just keep this in the um, HLRW stands for High Level Radioactive Waste, and it's spent fuel, or also called greater than Class C waste, and it, when it says high level radioactive, it means it's very radioactive. So when the reactor that is producing electricity, um, th they can't get a return out of the fuel anymore. The fuel is much more radioactive than when it went in as raw, as raw fuel. They put it inside of a can canister and then the canister is put into a pool that has a lot of boron in it because boron snatches um, beta and alpha radiation. And when it's been in the pool for about five years, they figure it's cooled out enough to put it in, well, that's when they put it in the canister. They dry it out and then put um, huge concrete overlay on the canister. And if you were standing by one of these, uh, it probably would be three times your height if you're six feet tall, which I'm not by a long shot. And um, and you stand by it, and you would put your put your arms out like this, and that it it would seem like it wasn't even round. I mean, it is a cylinder, but it is enormous. Now they are trying to make it legal to haul this thing. It doesn't. What did you say? Fifty thousand pounds or five hundred thousand pounds is the limit. Of, uh, for, for a truck going on a highway? 80,000 80, pounds. Well, these things weigh at least 20 tons. And they want to transport them from nuclear reactors to places in Texas and New Mexico. And this would be, as projected right now, mostly by rail. They would be coming through Chicago as has been explained here tonight, much better than I even realized. 
he said six major railroads have hubs in Chicago. Six out of eight? Six out of seven. Six out of seven major railroads have a hub in Chicago. And, um, uh, and, and these monstrosities would be going on railroads that are not equipped to handle anything that weighs 20, 20 tons. Um, and I think I'm underestimating it. I told a friend of mine who's really an expert, oh, I can't believe they weigh 20 tons. And she said, they weigh 50 tons. So, you know, it's an enormous, it's an enormous thing. And transporting them around the country would require th that all of our infrastructure be reinforced. Um, it's just a really, really, really bad idea. And you wonder how people even could consider it. So you know my organization, uh, Nuclear Energy. Re, re, nuclear Energy. Do I know the name of my name? Nuclear Energy Information Service. Thank you, Nuclear Energy Information Service. We recommend that um, these these um, uh, can, uh, these monstrosities be hardened against terrorism and kept on site, which means there would be 100 different sites where high-level radioactive waste would be held. Uh, the same problem applies if you want to take it to Yucca Mountain. Everything goes through small communities. There's no way to prepare every community that it would go through for an emergency if there were an accident. So uh, the, uh, the talk tonight really helped enlighten me on the real problem with transporting uh, high-level radioactive waste around the country, which uh, I think is the worst idea that's ever come down the pike. Uh, also, I wanted to talk about what Charlie said about people who um, are only interested in their own welfare and not the welfare of their community. There is a word called, and the word I'm thinking of is idiot. Now, idiot, idiot doesn't, uh, in the ancient Greek world, idiot did not mean somebody who was stupid or who was uh, intellectually challenged or anything like that. It, the I, I, I don't know the derivative of this word, although John probably could help us with, out with that. But in the ancient Greek world, it meant anyone who placed his own welfare above the welfare of the community, the welfare of his family and himself above the welfare of the community. And uh, you can see, sort of see the word I or id in idiot, but it is not the same as the way we use it now. Although, uh, when you look at somebody like uh, he who shall not be named, you have to think that he has got to be an idiot in both senses. Okay, and then I just wanted to say something about bridges, because I've been down in the Bay Area, and um, the Bay Bridge, uh, when I was there last, you crossed the Bay Bridge, but they were building another bridge next to it. And I think the transmission has been made to the new bridge. And strangely enough, I was also in Boston when the same thing was happening in Boston. They were building a new bridge, and we were crossing on the old bridge. And then at some point, they transferred the traffic over to the new bridge. So replacing those bridges by building another bridge and then uh, transferring the the traffic over to the new bridge, uh, it's been done. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, and I feel very fortunate that I was able to see it both in Boston and in the Bay Area. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Andy. Anyone else? Thank you. I'd like to thank our presenter tonight for this was one of the most concise, uh, understandable, coherent presentations I've seen here in since 2007, <laughs> since I've been coming here. So, it's we'll talk about that later, Charlie. We'll be in nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's not much I can add. Uh, there, there was an article the other day uh, with a fellow that uh, lost his house in Paradise, California when it burned. And he, he's moved uh, to another place now. Uh, in another state, I think. They might even be on the East Coast. And he said he, he recently took a trip to their local Costco. And he was just looking at, you know, thinking of all this stuff 
the, uh, a big store has and the transportation and it's linked together by uh, electronic tracking and everything else and he says what is our society going to be like if we have any kind of electronic problem yeah. <laughs> or uh, you know if, if somebody sets off a pulse weapon that fries microchips uh, it's many communities are almost going to go back to the stone age um, Fortunately, uh, we're moving toward resilience, as uh, Rocky Mountain Institute talked about. Berkeley, California is leading the way with a law. They appear to be the first state in the country, uh, city, to ban any kind of burning fossil fuel in new buildings. No oil, gas, no gas lines. Of course, the gas company got their shorts in a bunch when they passed that law, but they said, if you want to heat a building, it's going to be all electric, uh, solar, wind power, wave power, but it's going to be electric, no gas. They're just against the law to put gas pipe in any new building or construction, homes, buildings, whatever it is. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute recently uh, published a report about their new 15,000 foot, uh, 15,000 square foot business center. The heating system of that is the equivalent of 10 small houses, right? Well, the heating system is the equivalent of 13 hair dryers. There's no, not even one small furnace will be needed to heat the whole place because they spent the furnace money on the walls and windows when the place is built with solar control windows. So you can build, as Buckminster Fuller wrote back in the 1930s, designing the dome houses that were lightweight materials, a, a dome house that was energy efficient, needed no utility lines, basically could be transported by a helicopter and plopped down anywhere. And uh, the college, uh, the solar decathlon, every two years, they uh, collect about 20 homes from around the world and have a, a, a demonstration of what a light powered house looks like. Solar siding, Venetian blinds, uh, solar window shades, all kinds of things. The house is completely electric, powered by the light that falls on it. And the tenth, like a decathlon, the tenth thing they're graded on is how many kilometers can you drive your electric car being charged off the house. So the car uses the excess electricity and you just plop one of those things down. It's an 800 square foot transportable house that the college has built. It's called the Solar Decathlon. It's a college contest for the engineering, uh, construction engineering departments. It's been going on since at least 2005 that I know of. Uh, an article, uh, another thing that recently happened, uh, some of you have been criticizing me for years for talking about climate change and that it's where it's slowly seeping into the consciousness of Americans, especially in Miami and Houston, which are underwater now sometimes, that climate change is not a Chinese hoax. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, the scientists, the climate scientists are now apologizing for getting their computer models wrong over the last uh, 30 years or so. They say they were wrong in the effect that they thought changes that we'd see 200 years from now they revise it. Well, we'll see that in 100 years. Then they revise it next year. Next year they uh, come out, well, it's happening faster than we thought. Well, the new revised numbers taking into account uh, the tidal uh, waves coming in and out with uh, more water coming in because the ocean water is a little bit warmer, they revised the date where Miami and other coastal cities are going to be unlivable being flooded or underwater. That date has now been moved down to 2050, 31 years from now. So uh, if we don't stop burning fossil fuel, mostly in the next 10 years, the kids that are here now aren't going to be able to live in Miami. Most of the old people there will already right. passed away, but Miami will be underwater pretty much permanently from the hurricane and the flooding, and they won't even have to wait for the ocean level to rise 10 or 20 feet to bury it permanently. Same thing with Houston. If they get four feet of water every year, What's the difference if the ocean is rising or if they're just getting dumped down with four feet of water and flooded out? Houston could look like the Midwest with the farmers that got flooded. Anybody see pictures of what the Midwest looked like this year? These things are all related to climate change. So uh, I applaud our speaker tonight for showing us various different spots of where the protesters were doing what many groups have been advertising or distressing join together with other groups that are protesting. The, the Green New Deal, as it's called, is a new deal stress of, stressing uh, green technology, but it, it's a new deal talking about living wage jobs for everybody, housing for everybody. Uh, 
uh, well, electric trucks would be great. Uh, incidentally, uh, we have, if we do things differently, we have enough money for a fleet of Tesla's new all-electric trucks that wouldn't pollute the air and uh, wouldn't burn fossil fuel. Tesla has just uh, released plans or uh, specifications, in other words, for a 20-year battery for cars. Uh, all kinds of stuff like this is happening, and but, but the problem is the media doesn't cover it, and um, we still, I won't mention any names, but we have people in the cult of Thorium. Uh, <laughs> the, the nuclear power is a cult. There's more articles talking about the, our lady over here talked about nuclear power, the old nukes, and the problem. Well, it's the same thing, a lot of the problems with the old nukes is going to be mining, uh, transporting uranium and waste and all kinds of stuff. Any kind of new nuclear plant you build is going to have a lot of these logistical problems. <laughs> and with solar energy, which has dropped 97% in price in the last 20 years, the utilities are figuring this out. No, no utility backed by stockholders anywhere in America is thinking about building any kind of new nuke. So you know, anybody that's talking about a, a new nuclear plant of some kind, that's going to be welfare. Uh, our taxpayers, if we uh, afford it, will be giving welfare money to build those things, and they will only make a minuscule contribution to, they won't make any contribution between now and 2030. Right. The climate change problem between now and 2030 has to be solved. You have to get off fossil fuel in a few years, and nuclear power can play no real role in that because of the cost and the money. So uh, if Tim wants to ever schedule have Charlie, I'd be more than happy to have a debate. I'll take the side that nuclear power is not feasible, and you can have anybody come from the other side. We can have a debate on that. Oh, we haven't good. had a debate on that in several years there, haven't we, oh, Charlie? Yeah. Yeah, we have one every year with uh, Dennis Nelson. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean. you talk about that on Earth Day, right? I'm, right. I'm always going down to Champaign-Urbana for the Science Olympiad. Right. So, what? So, anyway, um, You've got to let me. Now, the last thing I'll mention is that DVD, uh, it's, um, it's a video, you can get it at the library, it's called The Brainwashing of My Dad, and it talks about how people are being brainwashed into believing things that aren't real by the beautiful talking heads from Fox News. Richard Nixon would never have been forced out of office if he had had Fox News back then. That, that's the consensus of everybody that's studying the current uh, impeachment supposed mm -hmm. trial of Donald Trump. And so um, our country, the future of our country is at stake, and we, we need to help our, our friends wake up and come back out of the cult of Trump into the real world, okay? so. Um, Thank you all, and uh, will uh, anybody out any other further wrap up other than our speaker? Yeah. Our speaker has Thank the final you. word. I'd like to get Just three one minutes. One more. One another minute. Yeah, or you, uh, you guys got to talk about getting the facts and information. <laughs> there is a lot of anti-trucking talk here, and no one mentioned the fact that the number one source of pollution for global warming, and burning cows. of fossil fuels, guess is what? Cows. Power plants. What? Cows. No. Power plants. No. Military. Trucks. Transportation. It's not long ago, uh, some in the transportation community was, um, transportation exceeded uh, home heating, building heating, or electrical production <laughs> as the source of, the uh, greatest source of uh, fossil fuel burning. So there, you guys got to keep up on it. That's that's good. You come to the cows, listen to people like me. <laughs> Speaking this last word, I'm going to take a couple minutes. Let's talk about thorium. How safe it is. Let me get this straight. You guys don't want to transport high-level nuclear waste that can completely be recycled. Oh, it cannot. Oh, you guys don't. And you and you want to. Go to all electric power on vehicles, which is going to have to be generated by electricity. And if you're not using some form of alternative stuff, it's going to be backed up by coal or or natural gas because of wind turbines and solar panels. Fake dichotomy. The problem is is that when you try to go to renewables, it doesn't work. What do you mean? Germany has now burning more lignite coal than they've ever been 
because they've been trying to back up the intermittency of wind and solar. They have some of the highest electric rates in Europe. When you go to France, it's still about 90% nuclear, they still have some of the lowest rates in Europe. Now, the problem with nuclear power is that we're using an ineffective reactor called a light water reactor. There's, and the problem is it hasn't been allowed to innovate for over 30 years. What we need are small modular reactors of the liquid fluoride type, whether they burn uranium-235 or uranium-233 and use thorium as a feeder stock. I can think of no better way to deindustrialize the world than to, quote, global warm, deprive people of their power and their goods. Watch what happens when you try to stop the transportation network, you try to cut power, and you tell people, oh, we have to cut back. The problem is, is that it's not going to happen. The rest of the world wants to industrialize. They're going to either do it through coal or through fossil fuels or hopefully through some better form of wind and solar maybe, but they're still too damn expensive. And yes, Andy, I do know about the reductions in this stuff, but when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, there's your natural gas plant that backs everything up. And we all know with a car, there's something called city mileage and country mileage. A standalone gas plant would produce a lot less emissions than one that's backed up by solar and wind. I'm not going to say much more. You don't have to. I'm going to say it for you. What's that, Charlie? You don't keep up on this stuff. Oh, yes, I do. No, you, I'm sorry, Phil, you don't. You're Everybody wrong. Everybody's been flagging around social media this week that, that <coughs> it was released. There's, enough, there's more wind power <coughs> to generate 10 times the requirement already of the world. Of the world. Yes, we know and that. And you think, and now, here, but it's you're, rightly you're advancing. Let's, let's have a choice here, ladies and gentlemen. We can embrace the technology that was that brought about, that now if something malfunctions with this technology, you can't fix it. You want to know why? Because it's radioactive. And if you try to go in there, you die. You can't fix this. This is not like opening the hood of your car <laughs> and looking around. That's why you or changing a tire. That's why you take a small <laughs> modular reactor, is, Charlie. You don't go in there. And a large one you don't. <laughs> because you can't it's radioactive and it's radioactive for decades. Yes. Now let me give you one fact in rendering your decision on what kind of technology we should use. By the way, global warming is kicking in. I just published a thing this week on the sea level <laughs> by 2050, and he wants us to muck around with some technology that's going to take probably 2050 before it ever gets turned on. But we're supposed to do that, by the way. Muck around and invest in this unknown technology of uh, venture capitalists, of which there are a dime a dozen in the world, and don't pay any attention to them. Um, but anyhow, what do you think were the two, the first and the second greatest catastrophes, calamities that took place on Earth that were man-made? What, what was the basis of it? Nuclear reactors. And you're, and the you're, number, of, this is easily, unquestionably, the greatest catastrophe. In the history of and the you're dead race, wrong, Charlie. Where you were doing this, and you actually approach us. This is illogical. You actually say, well, let's do it a third time. And some people say they have a reluctance to do it a third time. Do you blame them? Do you think the <laughs> That's what I mean. This is illogical. Thank you very much. Chernobyl, I think, and he's talking about you Fukushima. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, once again, Tim. Tim there was talks 56. And I there was 56. If, if somebody walked out in the street right now and took a crap on the sidewalk, every single person in here would be offended. Yeah. Because they would say, "You're gonna, you're taking a crap, and you're making somebody else clean it up." 
that's exactly what the nuclear industry is doing, except that crap is going to be poisonous for 10,000 years. They have no zero plan for long-term storage. They have zero plan for long-term security. And they, they don't even build in a cost. They say, we will pass that 10,000-year cost to, to somebody down the road. Yeah. It is immoral. All right. All right, our speaker gets the last word. I got, I, I'll just give you a 15-second quote. Uh, it's been published in several places. Talking about the benefits of nuclear power is like saying, well, other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was your trip to Dallas? Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? You're still there, dead there are wrong. some benefits of nuclear power, but they're vastly outweighed by these little accidents like Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. We almost lost Detroit. And the 10,000 year, 20,000 year uh, repositories that have to remain safe without contaminating anybody. If you recycle the waste, you don't have to keep it for thousands of years. Yes, you can. Burn it up in the water. One final thing. Burn it in the toast tube. One uh, Greta Thunberg has been quoted in some of her speeches as saying, why aren't people doing something about this? Are people evil? She says, no, they're uninformed about the facts. That's why these kids are protesting. And many people that believe in the future of nuclear power, like I did, I was once really pro-nuclear. I ran an all-electric house in 1981 before I started learning that efficiency and other alternatives would be cheaper than nuclear power. Today, there's no debate on which is cheaper. Yeah. And of course, uh, there's, a, there's a lack of spread of knowledge because of the blackouts, especially in Illinois. They do not talk about the houses without mm -hmm. furnaces in the Chalmburg. Those yeah. houses can be heated with two or three square yards of solar cells on the roof. Uh, and, and they don't need a backup at night when the wind or the sun's not shining or right. blowing. Okay, our speaker can come up if you have uh, final yes. comments. Get back on, get us back on point, please. Yeah. But apparently Tim has never heard of the whole house battery backup, so you run the house through the night on a, on a UPS I battery have. backup for the house. Those things are affordable now and being made by Tim. If you factor in the cost over the years, solar and wind is vastly cheaper, right? Vastly cheaper than nuclear power. You're yeah. about that. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I had a lot of fun and I, I hope people uh, learn some things. Um, you know, um, I don't know your name, but um, Andy. Over here. Dave. Uh, but, you know, if you're ever going down 55, um, you know, get off an Arsenal Road and you'll see something pretty impressive at work if you ever want to go and check out the Intermodal. Um, on the International Port Drive, if you keep going, there's a bridge where you can really get a great view of the BMSF uh, rail yard, and just yeah. see uh, everything that goes through there. Uh, we do logistics and warehousing tours um, as an organization, uh, and we'd be happy to set that up with people. I also recommend um, checking out the uh, New Republic article I mentioned on Elwood if you want to um, get a deep dive. It's a, a good read, good 20 minute read, but uh, well worth it. Um, someone suggested privatizing uh, the, the roles to deal with the problems I mentioned. That definitely is on the table. Um, I don't know if that will go through or not. Um, you know, we, uh, we would like to figure out some way to, you know, definitely tax the warehouses in an equitable way. Uh, I understand the thing about um, taxing trucks because they do do a disproportionate amount of damage. Um, but I, you know, I think we need to be conscious of the workers who drive those trucks. A lot of them are independent contractors uh, at this point. So even um, there's there's whole fleets of independent contractors who do these short runs uh, between the intermodal um, and the warehouses. So if we started taxing them, that be another hit and they're not doing too well already. We think that they're actually employees of a lot of these companies um, and that it's a misclassification of their workforce. Uh, but that, you know, that's an issue to highlight. Um, there, I mean, the, the you know, we, we'd really like to see the, such a, you know, generous 
tax break uh, and that's definitely our position. Um, automation is, is, uh, continues to be uh, a concern in the, the warehouses. Um, what was I? You know, yeah, like the, the infrastructure, I mean, none of this infrastructure was planned for uh, this kind of freight and uh, traffic. I mean, we're talking about two lane 1960 style highways. Um, I grew up in the area, no one had any idea that there'd be a major international port. Um, so that's, um, you know, I think that there does need to be real thought about how to fix the infrastructure. Um, down there, but doing it in a way where you know you don't have to pay taxes or pay tolls uh, to get on I-80 to go to the grocery store. We live in town, you know. I think we got to figure out how to make the businesses pay. Uh, the Corwith Yard is where the um, the intermodal was actually invented, which is off of Pulaski and I-55 south of the highway. Um, thank you, Charlie, for clarifying the intermodal part and uh, the history of it. Um, you know, I think uh, people brought up radioactive waste and things like that. I think the, what you should think about is that um, basically everything you can imagine goes through these intermodal yards, you know, whether it's commodities or waste or our products. There's a whole, uh, people ask me, what do we export out of these uh, places? Definitely food's a big one. Um, you know, corn, grain, um, whatever it is. Um, but also, uh, there's a whole, um, there's a whole warehouse uh, dedicated to recycling in Cook County. Uh, so if your, your recycling happens to get to that warehouse, it gets put on a train to go on a boat back to China. Um, so that's, that's an interesting anecdote. And then the, I think we are going to see uh, what Amazon's invest. The reason we targeted Amazon is because they have the largest fleet. So they're going to build 100,000 electric vehicles. I think that's going to create a market uh, in the future. And then we're going to see more electric delivery vans um, and trucks down the line. We're not going to see long long haul trucks are um, far off, but there, there's plenty of trucks that do shorter runs that could practically do electric to start off. Yeah. Did you so, see that the uh, high speed fast rail could make long haul? Guys study that at all? I'm not sure. Okay. Other countries are doing that. Feel free to send it to the trains. We'll do it better than the trucks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Give us out, Andy. Great speech. I guess we're uh, gaveled out until next week. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next week. We're, we're out. Thanks for bringing that.